that's why they made a big difference. Okay, so if anybody doesn't uh, believe me about what this is, the deep learning is based on backpropagation. Just about all the applications out there today are based on it. But if you don't believe it, let me give you a source. Almost all of the industry people I've heard excited by deep learning. First word out of their mouth is, and do you know about TensorFlow? Do you know about Google's TensorFlow? This is the package that will remake our business, our industry. This Google TensorFlow is like the number one go-to place for people starting up in deep learning. And from that web page, you'll see it talks about how you train the network. And it says, of course, you used gradient descent. Of course. Now, that means backpropagation. Some people like to use the word gradient descent because they think it sounds scientific. Backpropagation doesn't sound as scientific to them. But I would argue backpropagation is actually more scientific because when you say gradient descent, you're not saying what kind of derivatives you've got. And a lot of people got bad results in the early days because they didn't use the right derivatives. It helps to have a solid mathematical foundation and what people call backpropagation now, it's really the chain rule for order derivatives, which is much more rigorous than seat of the pants ways of calculating derivatives. Okay? There's a solid mathematical foundation with lots of other applications. Chain rule for order derivatives really is a, a universal kind of thing. And if you tell people how you're calculating derivatives, I think telling people how you do it is more scientific than, than leaving it fuzzy. That's my opinion. But I'm biased, obviously. So now people are saying, okay, this is easy. We all know how to do it. Training networks by using gradient descent. Of course, it's obvious. Or is it obvious? Well, when I started with this, it was certainly not obvious. When I started with this, people were telling me, you're a crackpot, you're a heretic. Don't you know neural networks will never work? They're a disproven heresy. It's not just that they're false. It is they are disproven heresy. They're right up there with perpetual motion machines. That's what they told me. And Marvin Minsky wrote a very famous book, which didn't exactly kill the neural network field. Bernie Woodrow has said, no, it's just the tombstone. It was already dead. He just recorded the death. <laughs> and basically, what one of the things the book said was, neural nets can never solve brain-like problems because they can't even learn a simple XOR model. They said, you need one hidden layer at least to do XOR. And everybody in the world with a brain, including me, has tried to find a neural net adaptation method to train it. Nobody has. And since I can't do it, it must be impossible. And if you say otherwise, you're insulting my intelligence. That's even worse. <laughs> and so for years and years, people said it was impossible. So there were two fundamental problems. Why didn't people just use steepest descent then? There was a paper by Amari where Amari said, why don't we use steepest descent? And then he went on to say, because it wouldn't work. And then in Japan, they cite that as, ah, this is the origin of backpropagation. When Amari said it wouldn't work, well, he said it wouldn't work. Why wouldn't it work? Because people didn't know how to calculate the derivatives efficiently and accurately in closed form. But the other thing is the type of neuron model they had at the time was not differentiable. And if you heard Alex this morning, differentiability is a critical technical issue here. Um, they believed in a threshold logic unit. People had just invented digital computers and they thought it sounds scientific to use ones and zeros and not continuous variables. And since the brain is modern and scientific, it must be a digital computer, it must be using ones and zeros. And of course, spiking neurons, you look at the spike, it looks like it's a digit, right? So I went to Minsky and I said, I have a solution. Let's not have conflict. Conflict is stupid. Let's co-author a paper. I'll let you share 50% of the credit. And here's a way to solve this problem. You didn't think of it, but what the hell? You know, you can share the credit. I, I didn't believe in fighting. Maybe I should have fought. I should have been like La Guzada, fought. Maybe that's how people win these days, I don't know. But I offered to cooperate. I said, let's share it. Um, I have a new neuron model, which is differentiable, and I have a way of calculating derivatives. The problem is solved. But Minsky said, no way, because your model of the neuron, we all know the neuron is a spike generator. It's one or zero. It can't be differential. 
Let's see if this can, is this system differentiable? Okay, so this is what I showed Minsky. What I showed Minsky was empirical data from the brain. There are lots and lots of people who talk about the brain. Some of them show you empirical data, some of them don't. I showed Minsky. These are recordings from one of the cells in, in the higher parts of the brain. There are many types of neurons. But for the highest level of intelligence, this is the kind of tracking we get. This came from a book by Rosenbluth. And when you look at this, I said, does this look like a square wave generator? And, and each one of these things, this is not a spike. This is what they call a volley or a burst. And what you see is with a regular time interval, something like eight times a second, you will see a burst of varying intensity. Now, if as an engineer I were trying to express a model of the system, I would say, okay, every eighth of a second, I get a volley of an intensity that varies between a minimum and a maximum. It's not a one or a zero. The code is every sample time you have a continuous number. So this is not a continuous eight clock system. This is a system with a clock. And the output is a continuous variable. And if you translate it into mathematics, you get a differentiable neuron. Uh, with Steve Grossberg in the room, I have to say, he also came up with differentiable neurons. And his were a lot cleaner than mine. But nonetheless, the key idea is if you consider rates, you get a differentiable neuron. There's a lot more to talk about. This is another hour topic. But way back then, it was well known in the hardcore neuroscience literature that bursts and volleys are really what you see. There's a guy named Barry Richmond who ran the laboratory NIH on the neural code. And he emphasized this kind of pattern. I had a lot of chances to talk to him. It's not the asynchronous world that you heard of. That's not what it is. That's not what they see in the data. Linus is another one who talked about it. There's a recent textbook by Baron Connors. If you want to get a quick idea of how does neuroscience work and you're an engineer, I strongly urge this beautiful recent textbook by Baron Connors. And the recent data show, surprise, surprise, there's still bursts. <laughs> the brain has not changed that much since I went to school. So that solved the problem. Oh, oh, I forgot to tell you the punchline, sadly. So I showed that to Minsky. I said, we can use a new model of the neuron. Now we can do backpropagation and we can train it. He said, I can't get away with it because there's too much religion out there in the field of computational neuroscience and the modelers. If I come up using a model that violates what they've been working on for 20 years, they'll all kill me. I cannot politically afford to do this. And maybe he was right. He's very successful politically. None of the stuff ever worked. It was an attempt to stop up work, but hey, politically it was successful. Okay, how do you calculate derivatives? This is the chain rule for order derivatives. This is what I did in my thesis. If we had time, I would run through it. It's very fundamental mathematics. I think every college course in multivariate calculus should include this type of derivative because it is so fundamental to all kinds of dynamical systems. Um, impulse multipliers and economics, you know, systems design. It's, it's very critical, but I don't have time to get into details. It is, um, the details are all on my website anyway. Now, convolutional learnouts. As I say, in 1988, this stuff was working very well, already, long ago. And I have to confess, I underestimated it. Let me show you what the way it works. Um, when Jan LeCun presented, he described it as a moving window. Instead of having, I don't know, 50 neurons inputting from nine squares all across this field of pixels, train one hidden neuron which inputs, nine inputs, has one output, and reuse that hidden neuron all over the whole square with the same weights. And then you only need to learn the weights for one simple neuron, and you reduce the number of weights. And for technical reasons in statistics, if there are fewer weights, you get more accurate estimates, you do a better job. And the empirical result was that using convolutional net networks, outperformed all other neural networks and all other methods for recognizing zip codes. This was back in the 80s. And you wonder, why didn't Google notice it? Well, they don't pay much attention to the post office. You know? um, the, the post office spent a lot of money on zip code recognition. They had a big contest. But the problem was, 
all of the people who were funded went out and gave talks saying they were the winners of the contest because nobody was getting in their way. It wasn't an internet kind of a thing. I happened to know the guy in the post office who ran the contest, and I asked him. And he said, there's no question. There are two teams that, hands down, beat everybody else. And one of them was the team Lacune was on at Bell Labs, and the other one was a German firm doing the same thing with convolutional neural nets. And this should be a warning. It was a warning to me because the general neural nets that I believed in in those days really couldn't <coughs> handle 100 or 400 inputs very well. And the people who said neural nets would never work on pattern recognition, well, they were right that simple neural nets couldn't handle that many inputs effectively. That was true. And to solve that problem, they applied this symmetry relation. There are basic mathematical reasons why exploiting symmetry can help you learn big problems. It, it's fundamental mathematics. It goes back to Immanuel Kant. It's kind of like special relativity. There are good mathematical reasons why it works. I didn't pay enough attention to convolutional neural nets in the beginning. And the reason is, it's not brain-like. We know brains don't assume Euclidean symmetry. The phony of the human eye is not rectangular. You know, you've got these brain cells in a very strange, scattered, circular pattern. Um, and I, I didn't believe it. But in the 1990s, I realized we need this extra power. Euclidean symmetry won't give it to us. Is there a brain-like way to achieve the same power? And so the bottom line is I came up with a new generalization beyond the convolutional neural network, which is brain-like, which assumes general non-Euclidean symmetry, which can learn this stuff. And I got a patent on it in 1998. The patent got transferred to a company, but we got some shares. The patent has expired, but we're still getting something from it. I'm told I shouldn't talk about it, but it's a major energy company that, 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 that took the transfer. So, so there's a more general thing called the object net, which I've often talked about, which is a generalization that's more biological. And that was part, okay, so I should say a little bit more about the object net. Uh, we heard today about convolutional neural nets, the feed-forward network, I mentioned it. If you put a simple timeline recurrence, you get what I would call a cellular simultaneous recurrent network. Not only did we do this 10, 20 years ago, in 2008, uh, Robert Kozma and I collaborated on a paper with a fast learning version of this, which we applied to a complex navigation learning problem, which the ordinary convolutional nets couldn't learn at all. The ordinary feed-forward convolutional nets would have error like 50%, you know, 80% error. I mean, they were just hopeless. But with this kind of advanced version, the more recurrent version of a convolutional network, we were able to, to nail the problem. And the details of that are in this paper, Transaction of Neural Nets, 10 years ago, with also a discussion of object nets and how they work. In fact, the 1998 patent this chart, which I call a roadmap, really summarizes mathematics we already developed. We already know how to do this. It's just a matter of implementation. Um, and there is a website where I talk about the mathematics line behind this. Okay, so now, let me move on a little. Um, so now let me get to the next big things. Um, CNN. Some of you know that cellular neural nets had a meeting connected to IJCN a few years ago, like in San Jose. And it was a very big, exciting thing. Hewlett Packard discovered that Leon Chua had predicted a new circuit element, which can be used for neural nets and memory and learning. They were really excited. And the concept was to combine what you would call a memristor, his circuit design, with the architecture of the CNN, which he also developed. And people were really excited a few years ago. There was a book by Cosma and another book by Anamatsky um, for the Chua Festschrift. 
that talked about memristors for more than just memory, the new flood of memristors. And some of you may wonder, what ever happened to those memristors? What ever happened to Leon Shure? Was it another flash in the pan? No. It's another case where people take your ideas and give them a new name because they don't want to give you credit. <laughs> it's the same thing. So Chua gave a talk here where he described that it was not only HP, there's a certain kind of hysteresis that 20 other companies started jumping into. And they didn't, unlike HP, they didn't want to cite where some of it came from, but they wanted to have their own proprietary products, and they didn't want to explain where they came from. The most exciting new product in that space right now is something called Crosspoint Memory. Um, I did a search on Google Images for an image with open permissions, open for use and non-commercial. And the first image I found was from Intel, which is one of the companies very proud about the new massive product line. Thank you. 20 minutes, okay. Um, I have looked very closely at what's inside it in a paper by Burr and Shinoy from IBM. And basically, if you look at this, they're selling memory. They're telling you it's memory. But if you look inside, it's a cellular neural net. This offers capabilities with neural nets, orders of magnitude beyond anything you're gonna find anywhere. Because this is hardwired right into small feature size silicon. General purpose silicon that can do almost anything. So this is a really big thing that's coming. And I can think of 100 applications that haven't been done yet. So there's a lot coming in that space. Um, but then what about recurrent neural nets? Oops. Oh, God. OK. The great discovery that you heard this morning was about time-like recurrent networks with speech. That's the main thing Alex was talking about. What Schmidt Huber was pushing was LSTM, which is his particular version of a time-like recurrent network. There are many special cases of a time-like recurrent net. We described the general case 20 years ago, and there were many other applications. I'm glad that the industry finally is listening. In fact, Schmidt Huber should take credit for a major culture revolution himself. Because after everybody started learning deep learning, static pattern recognition from Lacoon, Schmidt Huber walked in and said, but wait a minute, the world is not just static. Sometimes you want to predict things over time. You want memory. And so the LSTM has become a kind of gold standard, as you heard this morning. Um, there's a lot more to be said about this, to put it mildly. But we were doing this for many years. Ford Motor Company was for many years the world's leader in this. So there are people who said they never heard of recurrent networks before. Industry was not interested. If you go to Business Week in 1998, the president of Ford Motor Company announced to the world that within two years, every Ford company in the world will have a recurrent neural network inside it performing critical operations. In IGCNN 07 yes. in Florida, yeah. we had a special working group for the, ta the IEEE Task Force on Alternate Energy. There was Ford, there was General Motors, there was Siemens. And I asked the guys from Ford, hey, did this happen? You know, this is not uh, the year 2000. They said, yes. It's under the hood. Most of the cars in the world now already have recurrent neural nets. So in Barcelona, I, helped com I heard computer scientists say, when will we engage with real applications in the real world? There must be applications for real things like cars. Yes, and they've been there already for 10 years before you've even heard of it. They're in your car already. So Ford has played a critical role in comp competitions in this conference. But the problem is they weren't going to the press. Let's face it, Ford engineering does not get into the television as much as the latest app from Google. This is a cultural issue. Okay? So we needed the IT industry. There is a mathematical basis, which I've talked about here. My webpage talks about it. This is not an unscientific thing. I've heard Tchaikovsky was talking about statistics. The timeline recurrent network is a universal approximator for what good statisticians call a NARMAX model. This is very solid statistics much more powerful than the usual Box Jenkins stuff that a lot of statisticians use. We also heard a little bit about real-time adaptation, the um, synthetic gradients. 
To be perfectly honest, synthetic gradients were part of my patent that was granted 20 years ago. But it's okay, it already expired. But the point is, we know how to do this, we have known how to do it, maybe we should talk to Google about doing it, but yeah, there are other things. It's a very interesting area for research. There are reasons why Ford didn't follow up on it much, but they did do empirical tests, and they verified a more powerful form of synthetic gradient than what you heard this morning, which was working with real automotive applications. But since my time is running out, I bet better, oh God. 15 minutes, okay. So now, let's talk about the brain. My interest has always been in this issue of functional understanding of the brain. Just look at the inputs and outputs of the brain. You can see it solves a kind of control problem. It outputs signals. But is there a prediction in the brain? In the brain? My theory of brain functioning, I have published in neural networks, particularly in 2008 to 2012, and I, I cite that. And part of it is the claim that there is a universal learning to predict in the cerebrocortical thalamic loops. Okay? As I look at Robert, I, I think about Walter Friedman, uh, who died this year. It was wonderful to collaborate with him. It's a huge loss. One of the things that Friedman was most famous for was a book called Mass Action in the Neuroscience. Freeman was one of these wonderful people who could play with computational neuroscience, who could come here, but could also do hardcore systems neuroscience, which is way out of the box of the, the pure theoretical modeling. I was actually intrigued yesterday to hear that Makram is also more out of the box than I knew. He's, he's more of a systems neuroscientist than I understood, <laughs> even if he doesn't understand functional modeling yet. But the key thing that Freeman discovered is that different areas of the brain can take over the functions of other parts of the brain. So you have read lots of papers about the visual processing is here, the auditory is here, the motor is here. You've seen these maps of areas in the brain. The point is they're different in everybody's brain. If you do a map of a Japanese person's brain and the average American person's brain, things are in slightly different places because of learning and culture, and they change over time. If you damage one part of the cortex, 